صل على النبي على وال الآل رسول الله خير الأنام وآله يا رب صل على النبي الغالي الغالي رسول الله خير الأنام وآله يا رب صل على النبي الغالي الغالي رسول بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله في نعمه وكافي مزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وشيخ العظيم سلطانه سبحانك لا نحسيتنا أن عليك أنت كما أتريت على نفسه فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في المال العلى إلى يوم الدين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلك الأرض ومن عليها أنت خير الوارثين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير نفع انتفاع والفاد والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله بسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وشيلاء مرضاته وقلبه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Inshallah, now a continuation, a continuation of our look at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu We look at several great events that occur in the life and times of the Prophet sallallahu in the late Medani period. I mean, the most important of them, no doubt, is the Fath, is the great conquest of Mecca. This is the Prophet sallallahu retaking Mecca and now delivering it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most important. But there are also several other events which help sort of define that period for us. Okay, the first of them is the return of the great Muhajirun, of the great migrants who migrate into Abyssinia, led by Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib anhu And he migrated, if we recount back in the time of Mecca, that the Prophet is going to command several companions to migrate yani, beyond the Great Sea onto the land of Abyssinia, land in which the Prophet وسلم, says therein lies a righteous king in whose land nobody is wrong. And this is Ashama, Ashama, one of those, in our last session we looked at one of those who embraced the letter of the Prophet وسلم, in a good way, in the best type of way. Shows that he's considered from those who are, who enters into the fold of Islam and dies as a Muslim. In the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, that in the ninth year, the ninth year after the flight, after the flight, that he dies, and the Prophet sallallahu prays over Ashama. Today, a righteous king has died. Pray over your, over your brother Ashama. The Prophet sallallahu said. So the Jafar, saying the Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu taala anhu warda, particular, he is the one who leads the delegation, the second migration to Abyssinia. And this is approximately the sixth year after prophecy, i.e. seven years before Hijrah. And he is not going to engage his great cousin, the Prophet ﷺ, until the eighth year after Hijrah. Eighth year, approximately 15 years he doubts of the presence of prophecy, saying that Ja'far, to those who are alongside him, inside of Aqzum, inside of Abyssinia. But it's a great moment when Sayyidina Ja'far returns back to the Prophet ﷺ, and this is just after the Battle of Khaybar, or the Siege of Khaybar, which likewise we looked at in our last session. That's when they arrived back after the great sort of messenger of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Amr ibn Umayyar al Domri, when he goes over the Great Sea and he brings back the actual migrants upon the commandment of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back to Medina to Munawwara. The head of them being saying Ja'far. And Ja'far is of the most beloved people to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that he's one of the very few people who not only looks like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but also have the characteristics of prophecy. And he said, I say the Ja'far was the bore or had the, the, the greatest resemblance to the Prophet in terms of his physical his physical features as well as his internal characteristics, Sayyidina Ja'far. He's the elder brother of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, the elder brother. Ten years, he is older than Sayyidina Ali. He has an elder brother called the Aqil, who's ten years older than him. And then the elder brother called Talib, that's why Abu Talib, the father of Abu Talib, who's 10 years old. I mean, 10 years between the four sons of Abu Talib. 
Hussein Jafar returns back with the great believers alongside him comes the great migrants likewise of the Yemen Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari okay, those who were shipwrecked in Abyssinia and then come alongside Sayyidina Abu, Abu um, Sayyidina Ja'far and Abi Talib to Medina to Munawara at the time of Khaybar, after the conquest of Khaybar and likewise also others great people inside of our tradition like Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and likewise this is the appearance inside of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one of the great Imams of the companions Sayyidina Abu Huraira Yani Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhaf radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda it's a great moment for the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu although they were not present in the siege of Khaybar, the Prophet Sallallahu gives them a due portion of Khaybar. Yani one of the sort of, one of the, maybe the, the, the sad realities that we see inside of Sarah is that saying that Ja'far, who does not spend a lot of time with the Prophet Sallallahu and in five years he's going to be alongside the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inside of Mecca before the flight to Abyssinia. And then when he returns to Medina to Munawwara, just around the eighth year, after Hijrah, yani Sayyidina Ja'far is only going to remain with the Prophet for a few months. And upon that, the Prophet is going to send Sayyidina Ja'far alongside other of the leaders of the companions to a great war. And this war is called the Battle of Mu'tah, the Battle of Mu'tah. And this is due to the fact that the Prophet when he sent those various messengers to the various kings of the world. For amongst them, there were companions who were sent unto war, unto Caesar. And they were treacherously killed by some of the governors of Caesar inside of the Levant. So the Prophet ﷺ now is going to send an army north. An army north. Okay? The leader of the army is going to be the great Sayyidina Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. And this is on the express instruction of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu initially sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commands for the army to be raised. An army of 3,000 soldiers, and the Prophet is not going to be present inside of that army, and he doesn't march alongside of the army. And the Jews are going to ask Sayyidina Zayd ibn Halifa to go and impress upon the Prophet who is actually going to lead the army. And it's trickery, some of these Jews, it's trickery. So when they go to the Prophet, and the Prophet is going to eventually name three leaders of the army. The first of them is Sayyidina Zayd ibn Halifa, radiallahu ta'ala, and the and the Prophet said, if Zayd is killed, then the, what, the standard goes to Ja'far. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And then if Ja'far is killed in battle, then it goes to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha, radiallahu ta'ala, and Sha'ir, Rasul, the poet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the three he named. And the Jews made mention of the continuum of prophecy, that the nature of what of prophetic words amongst Banu Israel is that whenever the Prophet names a leader, Okay, in a, war, in a battle, that leader is ultimately killed. And they mentioned that to Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, and Zayd ibn al-Haritha, as if trying to frighten Sayyidina Zayd. And Zayd ibn al-Haritha makes mention that what I am beneath the commandment of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And these are people, Rabbu ala al-Mawt, that's the nature of the companions. Like death was something that they fully embraced, destiny. Uh, and everyone's destiny is to die. Kullu nafsin ba'iqat al maut. Allah Taala says, every soul shall taste, shall taste of death. So that's not something that frightens Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha, who is one of the most important people in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Someone we should really try to get to know, become familiar with. He is the companion who has one of the greatest apologies that you could ever have. Hib Rasulillah, the beloved of the Messenger of God Sallallahu we will not see that title for Abu Bakr. We will not see that title for Umar. We will not see that title for Uthman. We do not see that title for Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhum wardahum, the grateful. But it's a title that was reserved for this great being called Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhum wardah. Somebody who commanded the respect amongst the companions by virtue of the fact that he was the beloved of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Somebody who can boast on the Day of Judgment that before the prohibition, he was known as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd, the son of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari, had Zayd ibn Haritha lived until after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would have been the Khalifa Mustakhlaf. He would have been the first Caliph, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. Imam of the companion, somebody who death does not frighten. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam gets wind of a woman from the tribe of what? Of Ghatafan, from the Najdis. 
initials again it gives us a, a sense of the life and times of the Prophet وسلم, so the Prophet who lived a very very from one perspective a tragic life what do you mean a tragic life if we gaze upon the events, manifestations of destiny within the horizontal realm? Horizontal realm meaning like secular society take Allah Ta'ala quote unquote out of the equation. In that sense it's tragedy the life of the Prophet Whoever from amongst you is what is afflicted by a tribulation then they should seek comfort in that tribulation through me. The Prophet ﷺ said, why? There's not a single tribulation that man can ever face except that the Prophet himself ﷺ faced. But the Prophet ﷺ, it's as if from the time of declaration of prophecy until the very flight of the Prophet ﷺ to Allah ﷻ, that the Prophet ﷺ is under threat of death. Everybody and their auntie is sending assassins to kill the Prophet ﷺ. A woman from Nej sends not assassins who are their sons, and their grandsons gathers their entire family with one mission, kill the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. And what's frightening about that from one perspective is that these people, the Ghatafan, the people of Nej, that these are mercenaries, hired hands, hired killers. I mean, that's what they do, the Nejdis. And they are coming to Medina to what? To assassinate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam unleashes Sayyidina Zayd ibn Aritha. Okay? with a group of small sahaba, a small group of sahaba, to go and head off the woman with their children. And they go and they engage in battle, and in one sense, they're defeated, because Zayd ibn Haritha returns back to Medina, with the majority of those who went lo- alongside him, killed by these Khaqafanis. And so Zayd, when he enters to Medina, drenched in blood, he says, Wallahi, by God, I will not touch water until what I've dealt with this, what I've dealt with these people. And then he takes other Sahaba, goes out, heads them off once again, and kills every single one of them. Every one of them, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha. So this is one of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, somebody who was what fit for leadership of the great army of Mu'tah. And he's placed at the head of the army. And thereby they march north, this battle, the battle of Mu'tah, and they reach a place called Mu'tah, which is now southern Jordan, in southern Jordan. And there they're going to face the might of the Roman Empire. The Romans are going to send 100,000 soldiers from Rome, Byzantium, and another 100,000 from among the Arabs who were beneath what were beneath their control. An army of 200,000 are now going to face the might of the companions, who are only 300,000 in number. The companions, after taking advice, say the Zayd, they're going to decide now to what send way back to the Prophet ﷺ, what should we do? It's 3,000 3, against 200,000. What should we do? Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha begins to speak, radiallahu anhu, the third of the generals. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he says, it's a win-win situation for us. Either we vanquish the army, or we die and we go to paradise. And it's win-win, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha, radiallahu anhu, says. And in order to, to make sure this has impact upon the hearts of the companions, he's the poet of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet had three sort of senior poets. The most famous of them is Sayyidina Hassan ibn Thabit, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rada, Imam of poetry. And his poetry is most preferred. Why? Because his poetry was about Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His poetry was about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, speaking about the mahasin, the great akhlaq, virtues of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Ka'ab ibn, ibn Malik, radiallahu ta'ala, the second of the poets. And Sayyidina Ka'ab ibn Malik's poetry was about war, war. Okay, so he was the poet of war for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whereas this Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha, his poetry is about attacking disbelievers, hujum al-kuffar. Okay, poetry about attacking the way of disbelief. So he's the one who speaks in poetic form in order to have maximum impact upon the hearts of the companions to which they what they heed the way of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha and they what they ready themselves for battle in the morning. What's amazing about this event is that you see the nature of prophecy that the Prophet ﷺ in Medina to Munawwara, that he gathers the companions inside of the masjid. You see, we're used to it now, you know, live streaming, live television, or what have you. But they got it back then, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, that the Prophet ﷺ was giving them a live commentary in Medina to Munawwara inside of the masjid of what was taking place inside of Mutta. And so when the battle ensues, the battle ensues between the Romans and between um, in the army of the Prophet وسلم, led by Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha, quickly the standard of Sayyidina Zayd is going to be brought down and Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha is going to be martyred. 
And the Prophet ﷺ comments upon this, that Zayd ibn Haritha, of the most beloved people to the Prophet ﷺ, Hibbar Rasulillah, has been struck down, martyred, stushid. Then, the standard was taken by the great Sayyidina Ja'far, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. And now Sayyidina Ja'far, likewise of the most beloved people to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam, takes to the standard, and he fights valiantly, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. Until obviously because the standard is a sign of leadership, and the idea is that when you bring down the army by taking out the leaders, that was the nature of ancient war, those type of wars that were engaged, that were engaged in. If the Prophet wasn't present, then he was target number one. And if he was not present, then who controls the standard? So now it's in the hand of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, and Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala after carrying the standard on horseback alights his horse in order to engage in battle, holding the actual standard in battle. When he does this, the Romans go for Sayyidina Ja'far. Sayyidina Ja'far, when he's martyred, they're going to find over 80 different wounds on the body of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. So you understand what people were trying to do to Sayyidina Ja'far. Ja'far alights his horse and then begins to fight radiallahu ta'ala violently. When the Romans goes for Sayyidina Ja'far with like a long spear, and then he stabs Sayyidina Ja'far, and penetrates the actual armor of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. Sayyidina Ja'far takes the actual spear and pulls it right through himself, radiallahu ta'ala, and to show you bravery, shivery, brings it right through himself, severs the head of the one who did it. And he kills him, and he brings himself right to him, and kills the one in front of him. Then they begin to attack, attack Sayyidina Ja'far al-Anhu, the Romans, and then they sever his right hand, because he has standard and he has sword. They sever the right hand of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. Sayyidina Ja'far takes the standard with his left hand. And this standard is the standard of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. La yanbaghi. It's not appropriate for that standard to fall. That standard will never fall up until the day of judgment. We will see it aloft, the standard of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now Sayyidina Ja'far is carrying the standard of his left hand. They strike the left hand of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. Sayyidina Ja'far takes him with the stubs, the stubs of his war, of what's left of his arms. I mean, you have to understand this, keeping the standard aloft. Because those men, I mean, men of the 15th century, the Muslims, we would be a hundred miles and running in that type of situation. That's real uh, for us. Okay, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was able to cast us inside of some type of similar situation, how would we fare? Well, you have no arms. And to keep just the standard alive, and it may be we're just trying to keep ourselves alive in that situation, that's not what the great Imam radiallahu ta'ala is thinking about. And then they attack Sayyidina Ja'far, and in the riwayah, when they attack him, they split him in two. And he severed such that his entire body is split into two halves, Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa And the Prophet is given commentary of this. And then the spirit of Sayyidina Ja'far, the Prophet sallallahu says, with the descent of angels, it takes wings. Wings are given to the spirit of Sayyidina Ja'far. And Sayyidina Ja'far takes flight to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unaided by angels. And that's why he's called Ja'far al tayyar Jafar the aviator, huh? Jafar the one who took flight by himself, unaided by angels, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. And that's why Al Jafar, the family of Jafar, who are one of Ahl al Bayt, according to the school of Imam Abu Halifa in particular, they single out upon amongst them the family of Jafar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. They were known as the family of Ibn Jayya, of, 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 of Jinahain, the family of the two winged one. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala an, when he used to meet, the son of Ja'far, his name is Abdullah ibn Ja'far, he's one of the Abadila Sahaba, one of those elite companions, young companions, who all their names was Abdullah, they called the Abadila, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Ja'far. That when Abdullah ibn Umar would meet Abdullah ibn Ja'far, he would say, Ya ibn Jihahin, oh the son of the two winged one, his father who takes flight unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unaided by angels. And at that point, Rijal. What is it saying? And now Abdullah bin Rawah, who remember, he's the one who quoted all of that fine poetry for the battle to commence. And now, you've seen what's happened to the first two who took the standard. What are you going to do? Initially, Abdullah bin Rawah feels that his nafs is in a state of rebellion, doesn't want to take the standard. Then Abdullah bin Rawah is now going to recite poetry to his nafs. 
remind the nafs of its own mortality. And upon doing that, he yani, has the courage, radiallahu anhu, to take the standard. And as soon as he takes the standard, he, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, arda, is struck down. The three leaders that the Prophet Sallallahu appointed, every single one of them struck down. And at that point in time, it's shura between the companions in the midst of battle, who then takes the standard. And they're going to settle upon Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid, Rasulullah ta'ala anhu waddaan. This is the emergence of the sword, of the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina to Munawwara, live commentary, said, and then a sword from the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes control of the battle and gains a decisive victory. The Prophet Sallallahu said, and it was through intelligence, strategy, Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid is of those people of striking intelligence. And what's amazing about Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid for us, because maybe this period is about the transformation of the human self. Because Islam is ultimately about transformation from wherever you are, when religion engages your heart, to wherever you should be as it relates to your potential, Allah, the potential that Allah Ta'ala created you in. And Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid is like brand new Muslim, Brand new, They're speaking about Muslim for roughly a month or two months. And the Prophet used to say about Khalid ibn Walid, he used to say to his brother, whose name is Walid ibn Walid, hasn't Khalid came to his senses yet? And when Walid ibn Walid, the brother of Khalid, would meet Khalid, he would say to the Prophet, the Prophet made mention of you. Walid's Muslim, this is the period of Hudaybiyah. There's no war between what the Prophet and Quraysh, so they can go freely from Mecca to Medina. And so Walid ibn Walid meets Sayyidina Khalid inside of Mecca and he said to Khalid that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made mention of you. He said, what did he say about me? He said, yeah, you haven't came to your senses yet. He said, I thought the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, I have good belief that the intelligence of Khalid will see him out of the situation in which he's in. Uh, and that's why we saw that when Sayyidina Abu, Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As ta'ala and meets, comes back from Abyssinia after becoming Muslim at the hands of the Negus of Abyssinia, when he comes back from Abyssinia and he meets Khalid ibn Walid and Uthman ibn Talha, both of them on their way to Medina, and then he says, where are you going, Ya Abba Sulaiman? Amr ibn As asked Khalid, where are you going, Ya Abba Sulaiman? He says, Aqal too. I have came to my senses, I'm using my intelligence now, I'm going to Medina to become Muslim at the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu I mean, that's one thing, but what's amazing, is only like a month or two after, there he is in the midst of battle, radiallahu ta'ala, and, and one gains a decisive victory for the Prophet Sallallahu This is the emergence of the sword of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, Khalid Wali. Never struck down in battle, radiallahu ta'ala, and who were not. Supreme general, to this day, studied in West Point of Wahhabi, Sayyidina Khalid Walid, radiallahu ta'ala, never struck down in battle, never defeated in battle, radiallahu ta'ala, and who were not. And he said the reason, the hikmah, why Sayyidina Khalid was never defeated, because he's a sword of Allah ta'ala. And the sword of Allah ta'ala can never, can never be what? Broken in the more metaphorical sense, in the midst of war. Although in this war, in Murtah, Khalid ibn Walid broke nine swords. Nine of his swords broke in battle in the battle of Muqtah. And he used all types of strategy available to him, radiallahu ta'ala, and organized 3,000 into units. And he would make one come in the midst of the night, kick up, just ride your horses, kick up dirt. The youths go to the back, the others come, kick up dirt. So the Romans are thinking reinforcements, reinforcements, reinforcements. They now they perceive 3,000 as possibly 3 million, okay? Why? Because the Prophet Allah Ta'ala speaks about like 10 to 1. That's the perception of the disbelievers of those who they face or those fight against. That one person can be perceived to them as 10, 10 times them, 10 times greater than them in number. So eventually they gain a decisive victory and the Romans retreat. And then the Sahaba returned back to Medina to Munawwara, returned back to Medina to Munawwara. It's a sad time for the Prophet Sallallahu no doubt. And before they return, he has knowledge Sallallahu Alaihi of what has transpired. And of the most difficult things for the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi that he is going to break the news to those beloveds, the beloved of the family of Zayd radiallahu ta'ala, and the beloved of the family of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala, and he has to break that news. He goes to the house of Ja'far. Radiallahu anhu is married to a very great woman in Islam whose name is Asma bint Umais. And the wife of Sayyidina Ja'far, the wife from the times of Mecca, she made Hijrah alongside him. 
Sayyidina Asma bint Umayyis radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. He goes to the house of Sayyidina Asma and he tells Sayyidina Asma, bring all of the children. Like he's not just going to break it to the mother and tell the mother to break it to the children. He himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is care and concerned for those children that he will break it to the children himself. Radiallahu ta'ala, I mean, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Asma bint Umayyis brings all of the children of Sayyidina Ja'far to which the Prophet begins to rub their heads and smell the heads of them. And then the Prophet said, Asma said, it's as if you have news of Ja'far. She says to the Prophet and the Prophet said, Ja'far was what? Was martyr that murta, martyr of murta. Okay, very painful for what? But the great woman who then begins to cry, she is what? She then, thereafter, she becomes the wife of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Uh, she marries the great Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Great woman, you can see by her husbands. And after the death of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, she married Sayyidina Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. And after the death of Sayyidina Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, she married Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Ja'far. And look at the four husbands that she marries, which tells a lot about society, a woman who, who lost their husband or was divorced or what have you. It was very straightforward for her to remarry and remarry great people. I mean, what is it that you stand upon the day of children, you were married to Ja'far? What is it that you were also married to Abu Bakr? What is it that you were also married to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf? What is it that you were also married to Ali ibn Abi Talib, the last of your husbands? And many say, the Zahir is that's who where your husband will be in paradise. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ta'ala. Woman, the woman who shrouds Fatima, Fatima ibn Tal Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She's the one who shrouds Fatima, the Habashiya, Umar would call her, or Habashiya. When he sees Asma bin Tu'amay, he oh, Habashi, Abyssinian woman, he would call her. Why? Because she lived a long time in Abyssinia. Uh, Habashia. And from Abyssinia, she learned many things. She learned how to cover the entire body of a woman. She took that from the Abyssinians. And on that basis, she showed Sayyidina Fatima Zahra al-Batul how to ensure that her entire aura was what was covered in her life. Such that Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha wa daha, then in her wasiyah, said the only person to shroud me upon death is Asma bin Tumais. And that's a great woman. And so it came to pass so that even in a dramatic moment when our mother Aisha, the great woman Aisha, was to enter upon Sayyidina Fatima, um, Fatima bint al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam on her death to assist in the washing and the shrouding of Fatima, Asma bint Umais radiallahu ta'ala anha refuses. Nobody enters. This is the wasir of Fatima. She doesn't want nobody to see her aura, nobody. I have the wasiyah. Aisha goes and complains to whom? Abu Bakr, who is the khalifa, the khalifa, the caliph. And Abu Bakr comes, remember Abu Bakr is the mother, the, fa the father of Aisha, but also the husband of Asma bin Tirmais at this point in time. And then when he speaks to Asma bin Tirmais, Asma bin Tirmais says, no, no, no. nobody enters. This is the wasiyah of Fatima, nobody enters but me. And then Abu Bakr turns around, tells Aisha, go home, go back, nobody enters. That was the request of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she must have been a special woman. And that must have been a very special request. Why? Because Abu Bakr himself radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda then places in his wasiya, nobody washes and shrouds me, put Asma bin Tirmais. So the death of Abu Bakr, Asma bin Tirmais, that great woman is the one who washes and shrouds the great Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa anha. These are the companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them. Okay? That's mutta. And what now is going to occur is the breaking of the treaty of actually Hudaybiyah. The treaty of Hudaybiyah.